Uh, welcome to the third week of the leadership workshops. Um, this session is on crucial accountability and influence. And so some of you um, will be familiar with the crucial accountability aspects, um, but the crucial influence aspects will be new to all of you. Um, that said, still similar expectations as we've had in the previous couple leadership workshops. Um, in that for those of you where some of this information is more of a review, um, then you have the opportunity uh, to model that uh, behavior um, and to provide space for others to practice that behavior as well. Also a reminder to everyone that of course, we're gonna focus on these topics in tonight's leadership workshop, uh, but we don't then stop. Um, every regular season meeting, every um, Robots After Dark, every meeting with new members is a place for us to practice these skills, um, to refine these skills and, and to learn from each other. So I'm pleased this evening to introduce Mr. Shop. He is joining me in, in tonight's leadership workshop um, and he is going to be the one uh, to get things started. Actually, I'm gonna still do this part. Oh. <laughs> um, sorry mm -hmm. about that, got ahead of myself. Um, so I mentioned uh, how this is related to, to crucial conversations. Um, some of the ideas uh, from this evening relate to two books from the Crucial Learning Organization, one called Crucial Accountability, which we featured last year, and a newer um, text called Crucial Influence, um, which uh, we've incorporated into the Leadership Workshop Series for the first time. Um, we will remind you of the parts that relate back to crucial conversations, um, but we're not gonna focus on reteaching them. We don't really have time for that. We want to focus on the new ideas and accountability and influence. Um, if you didn't see the crucial conversations uh, workshop a couple weeks ago, um, it is in our YouTube channel on our playlist. Um, and so if you feel like you need to go back and see that by all means, please check that out. All right. Now Mr. Shop is gonna take it away. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for being here tonight to learn more leadership skills. Much like crucial conversations, you want to begin with the end in mind when you're working on accountability with another person. You want to know what you want for them, for you, for the relationship, and you want to know what you don't want as an outcome. And just like in crucial conversations, if you notice it going off the rails verbally, pause the conversation and see if you can start over vocally answering these questions. Crucial conversations and accountability are long-term investments in our team, not shortcuts. You will each need to do this long range work to benefit from it. Trust and therefore culture hurts when accountability is lacking. So we want to work hard at getting this right. We note trust here and we'll focus on it more later because team culture is built on all the relationships in the team. The foundation of relationships is trust. Here are the main topics we will talk about in the first half tonight. Please take note, please take a moment to read these to yourself. We asked you to read an article about the fundamental attribution error. Speaking from experience, when you make the fundamental attribution error and assume that the other person didn't meet their commitment because they are a bad person, it's like you've told yourself a victim or villain story from the crucial conversations training. After that, it's really easy to have your motives shift and you want to punish the other person. Very quickly, you'll find yourself putting the other person in their place for being the lazy, no good person that you've told yourself that they are. But what does that do for your relationship with them? 
Will you be respected and welcomed by others after you berate them? If you were the person who lost an argument, would you feel good about giving this team all your free time? So we're gonna do act one, accountability and action. Mr. Shop is a team member and Mr. Schmidt is a project manager. You ready? I'm ready. Go. The scene starts in a classroom on a meeting night. Mr. Shop, do you have a moment? Sure. I noticed this afternoon that it appears that you didn't update the Trello card for assembling the Bazinga arm. I just came from 116 and they're trying to find the gusset used to rivet the Bazinga arm to the robot. Oh, I know where that is. I put it on the assembly RSU last night. I'll go get it for you right now. Mr. Shop leaves to get the gusset and returns a few minutes later. While gone, Mr. Schmidt thinks to himself, here's another example of Mr. Shop being too lazy to do the right thing. He's always so lazy. Wait a minute. That's not really true. There are probably other factors that led to all of this. All good now. Here's your part. Thank you for getting the gusset. You're welcome. You know, a lot of people don't update Trello. I agree with you that others don't consistently update Trello. I'm working with them as well. Yeah, last night I forgot that I'd be working on the Impact Award today and thought I would still be working on the Bazinga Arm Assembly. So I didn't think updating Trello was that important since I knew what to do next. Well, that is understandable. Plans often change. You may miss a meeting unexpectedly or be pulled into a higher priority task. Our schedule this year is really aggressive. We need to be efficient, which means everyone needs to be able to quickly figure out the status of any task. That's true in terms of updating Trello. I'm too busy with homework when I get home after robotics. I don't think I can reliably update Trello after the meeting. It is good to be honest with yourself. A week later, Mr. Shop, is everything okay? We have not seen you for the past week. Oh uh, man, I was sick for a few days and then I had a band concert. I hope you're feeling better now. Thanks, I'm starting to feel a little better. I noticed that Trello wasn't updated for the Bazinga arm assembly story. I also noticed that you're bothering me again about getting about uh, me keeping up the uh, updating the, the Bazinga arm in Trello. We all know what we're doing. Do you have to make a big deal out of updating Trello? No one knew where you left off and we're not able to make any progress on it. And we're a week late in delivering the Bazinga arm. If you care so much about Trello, why don't you update it? So that was the end of act one. So if we come across an accountability issue with a team member and we fall into the fundamental attribution error, we will likely first think that person is not motivated to do a good job. Or maybe we'll think way outside the box and think that they don't have the ability but even then we'll miss all of these other possibilities. The six sources of influence are grouped together in motivational and ability influences. Each of these is subgrouped into personal, social, and structural issues. With these simple examples, we hope that you can see similarities and differences across a single row or column. Personal motivation. I just don't wanna change the light bulb today. Social motivation. My friends say it's better to study in the dark. Structural motivation. It's not my job to change the light bulb, it's my parents. Personal ability. 
I can't reach the box of bulbs. It's too high in the cabinet. Social ability, chores, and homework equal no time to change the light bulb. And the last, structural ability. We don't have any new light bulbs in the cabinet. Mr. Schmidt, would you please drop the link to the slides in the chat? We are going to break out into groups. Be sure to introduce yourselves to each other. We will have time for a few groups to report out. So choose a speaker for your group. Develop two examples of the sources of influence. See if you can make them robotics related. And are you ready for breakout groups, Mr. Schmidt? I think so. We're gonna have six breakout groups um, with four or five people in each. We're going to shoot for four or four minutes in total. So you're going to see a three minute timer counting down in the breakout. Um, but remember, then you get like a 60 second warning before you actually need to return to the main room. And I'd like to so, add, um, it would be nice if, if we have each group report back on one of the six um, influences. That would be nice if we get six different, uh, one, one of them from each of the teams. So let's assign, so this, this is all on your slide um, in terms of the breakout. Um, and so we'll count down by columns. So personal motivation will be breakout room one, social motivation two, structural motivation three, personal ability room four, social ability five, and structural ability six. All right, here we go. All right. I think everybody is back. Welcome back, everyone. So, room one, personal motivation. So who's group got one. it? Who wants to lead us on an example for personal motivation? I got it. Thank you. Okay, we said um, that you want, you're motivated to to like cat a specific part because either you're like interested in learning more about design and CAD, or you're just interested in like that part specifically. Okay. Um, room two, how about social motivation? Cool. For room two, we said um, one, one example was not putting your safety glasses on or putting them on because other people said, um, you know, not putting safety glasses on is, is cool and everything like peer pressure. And then another example was not updating Trello because all of your sub team members were like, it's not worth the hassle. And then you just go along and it's like, oh, it's all right. You're not motivated to update Trello. Thank you, Anderson. Those are definitely some interesting examples. Uh, room three, structural motivation. Yeah, um, we came up with scouting as something that's very structurally motivated. People may not want to scout because it's not their official responsibility. They're not part of strategy. Therefore, they won't want to scout. Okay. Thank you, Lodo. Uh, group four, personal ability. Our example for personal ability was taking a random member and telling them there's been a battery spill that they need to clean up. Okay, thank you. And do we have a uh, room five? Do we have a social ability? Yeah, um, we talked about how, like if someone said that they were waiting on assembling something because no one sent them the assembly workflow. I could see that be challenging. Thank you for the example. Um, and room six, structural ability. Um, we said that like if something's not getting done in a sub team, you like kind of change it up and maybe design a role for one person to just monitor that task or something like that. Okay. And I appreciate all the teams coming back with some ideas here. Let's take a look at what we can do as servant leaders to address these six sources of influence. We will start with make it motivating and move on to make it easy for 
ability influences. Most team members do not attend the sprint planning meetings and aren't necessarily aware of the complex interdependencies of each sub team to the other sub teams. They might not see how their actions can help the team meet the team goals. In other words, they might not feel needed. In this case, your job is to help the other person to understand these potential outcomes that they cannot see and why it's important for them to do the task so that they can see how their actions can directly help the team. This will help them to develop the motivation to find ways to get the task done, even if they run into problems. Check for their understanding. Try another example. If they don't understand, but, and I'm gonna need Mr. John, if he's here, and his best singing voice to help me. Stop in the name of love. I had to give you that one, Mr. John. Don't, uh, don't keep pounding it in. So, yeah, don't keep piling it on. As soon as they understand the job, as soon as they understand your job of providing examples is done. So now you know the two main skills of make it motivating. They apply to situations where the person is having problems with personal, social, or structural motivation. We will go into breakout rooms and you'll have the opportunity to figure out how to apply this to the examples. For this breakout room, choose one of make the visible invisible statements and come up with the type of member for which this could be an effective explanation. These will all work well for different members. So we really want you to focus on explaining why you think one of these could help a particular fictional member. Remember to choose somebody to report out that's not already spoken for your group. And are you ready to send the groups to breakout? One, here we go. All right, looks like everyone is back. Awesome. Um, and so we're going to do this a little differently. We're not going to call on every team. So um, if your team would like to report out, please raise your hand and we'll call on your team. We'd like to get at least uh, two teams to report out what they, what their thoughts are on this. Uh, I see uh, Stefan's hand up. Yeah, so we did the bottom right one which is the since we couldn't get the feature working on time and so we said that that explanation could apply to somebody like working close with the fpms like in any of the sub teams and kind of like helping them understand how crucial the like their work on the feature is uh for like the rest of the team yeah i mean i could totally see um if you're building a feature how you might lose track on the fact that the guy down the road from you might be impacted if you can't get your feature delivered on time. And, and being able to explain that to them might help them, you know, better relate to why they need to get it done, you know, quickly or on time. Do we have, uh, oh, I see another hand up, Franklin. Yeah, so our group, we did um, top right, the sprint planning meetings one. And sure. we said that um, what we could do is we could, like during the sprint planning meeting, we could, um, if someone's like talking too long on the floor, or not on the floor, like if they're talking too long, or if um, they just keep going on and on, we could tell them, okay, hey, we got to move on. This is like, all the time that we spend during the sprint planning meeting is time we're not spending working towards the robot. I I can see that. Uh, maybe if somebody isn't ready for their their um, presentation at the meeting too, that could be a good thing, you know. And how um, 
dragging the meeting out too long shortens the time you have to spend developing all of the things that you guys need to get done. Very good, very good example. Um, uh, last one, how about uh, Aaron? Um, we picked top left and we figured maybe it was just someone not super familiar with like Trello and all the things we usually use to keep track of the paths we need to follow. So our solution would have been show them through Trello canvas where we keep all of our documents and all of our tasks and teach them how to reference it when they need to. Um, I have never used Trello until I came here. So um, if nobody had shown me how to use it, I would have been a little uh, flustered with if I had to use it and no one explained to me how to use it. I could, I could see totally see that that would be a problem in, in not being able to communicate things correctly and keep track of stuff. Thank you for all of your answers, guys. Let's turn now to ability issues. Making other people's jobs easy is the main focus of leaders. Remember, this is not a motivation issue, it's an ability issue. So we're not trying to encourage people to do painful, tedious, or obnoxious work, but instead finding ways to make work less painful, tedious, or obnoxious. When you have determined what the problem or source of influence is, say to them, you've been working on this, what do you think should be done? If you provide the answer, you may both overlook a better solution. That is power bias. You will also steal from them the ability to practice finding solutions. Agree and support their idea if it looks like it'll work. Partner with them in brainstorming if you have major concerns. Let's try on, let's focus on buy-in for a moment. A solution that's tactically inferior, but has the full commitment of those who implement it may be more effective than the one that's tactically superior, but is resisted by those who have to make it work. In other words, don't fall into the trap of wanting the other person to pick your idea because you think it's best. You will certainly not be the best idea if nothing gets done. This is gonna be uh, a chat room exercise. So um, we're gonna ask you guys to put your answers in chat. What does it feel like when someone asks you for your ideas on how to solve a problem? And they totally ignore your ideas and, and tell you what to do. Or they have the correct answer in mind and they keep hinting at it until you get it. How did you feel? Uh, what was awkward about that? And I'll pause for you guys to kind of throw some of your answers in. What could you have done to help the conversation go in a better direction? And what can you do to not put someone else through this? Mr. Schmidt, I've lost my chat room. I don't know where it went. There it is. So if we could get your, your groups to, or personally, just start putting stuff in chat so we can see what your answers would be. That'd be great. You have um, any answers in chat? Maybe people are busily typing stuff. Could be. I'm a slow typer myself, so I can understand that. How about the first one? How did it make you feel and what was awkward? Do we have any answers for how did this situation make you feel and what was awkward? I can totally see how people would think like their opinion doesn't matter. If, you, if, 
if someone asks you for their opinion and and just kind of glances over you and moves on to something else. I appreciate the answers, everyone. What could you have done to help the conversation go in a better direction? would like to put a chat in for number two what could have could you have done to help the conversation go in a better direction i think a couple hit on that there's a suggestion here to gently let them know they're doing it and learn oh, to uh look I, I that. and then yeah. point out what they're doing ask if they actually want their idea <laughs> or, if, or if they just want to share their idea and get some feedback on it Okay. And does anybody have any thought for number three? How do you not do this to somebody else? So what I, what I think of when I hear number three is it's um, the crux of inclusiveness, right? Listening to everybody's ideas and trying to take the best pieces of each of them. I appreciate everybody's input. Thank you. It is important to note that like in crucial conversations, you may find yourself needing to repeat. But here the issue is more that the person may not feel comfortable telling the whole story at the beginning. So after you've worked on a motivation problem, you need to check to see if there's any other roadblocks stopping them from completing the task. There might be an ability problem. You might not know until you get curious and ask them, is there anything that you know that could keep you from getting your task done? Asking will not get you the answer if you have not shown compassion and built trust with them. Congratulations. You've now opened your mind to the first part of crucial accountability. This knowledge will help you get past the fundamental attribution error of thinking that a person is lazy, incapable, or evil. These skills will help you remove the roadblocks of motivation and ability like any good servant leader should do. This will take practice. Remember back to last week and the definition of compassion as empathy and action. Action requires work. You're going to have to put in work of trying, sometimes failing and trying again. And remember, being transparent about failure is one of the strengths of a team player. Now we can learn how to make a good accountability plan. The plan is very straightforward. The first three steps, who does what by when, are very easy to lay out. Remember to be specific. For example, in the does what step, make sure you both agree on what done looks like. Is it that the prototype has been built or is it, or that it has been tested? Maybe the list of parts has to not only be prioritized, but communicated to the person responsible for the next step. And by when, generally means a date and a time. Let me provide a counter example. Does, done by Thursday mean 
it will be done before the meeting starts or by the end of the meeting. It might mean two very different things to the people in the conversation. So get rid of the confusion and specify the date and the time. For example, please have it done Wednesday by 5.30 so that you can report out at the supper meeting. Then you agree on a follow-up method and summarize the plan. We'll talk more about the follow-up soon. Let's focus for a moment on summarizing the plan. It simply means that after the who does what by when and the follow-up have been discussed, you want to put it all together in one statement and check for agreement. For example, so we said that you would inventory all the shop bot bits and post the list on the open Trello card by the end of Saturday's meeting. We also said you would check in with me Saturday at lunch to let me know how it's going. Do you agree with this plan? That's all it is. It's a summary with a question for their agreement. Now let's focus on the follow-up part. We all wanna believe that if we had the conversation and agreed to the plan, then the other person is going to have no problem getting the work done on time and to specification. But we've also learned today that there's a framework for the things that we've always known can get in our way. We may not have had the words for it previously, but many of us have known that our motivation and ability are affected by personal, social, and structural influences. Given this personal reality, we have to recognize that these six sources of influence are going to continue to affect the person even after the accountability conversation. That is why we need a follow-up. But following up with someone can be tricky. If you have too many follow-ups, they might feel like you're micromanaging them. Not enough follow-ups, or if you forget the follow-up, they could feel like you don't care. That is why we need to agree with the other person on the frequency of the follow-up. Note that some tasks are small and can be done in a relatively short amount of time. And some are longer and may lend themselves to more frequent status checks. Similar to your project management reviews. Lastly, there may be reasons why the person assigning the task should follow up, and there may be reasons why the person who owns the task should perform the follow-up. That is why we also need to agree with the other person on how to follow up. If you're nervous that the task and person combo is going to run into problems from any of the six sources of influence, then propose a checkup. You own this checkup. So you need to make sure that you remind yourself in a proven way to do the checkup. Make an alarm on your phone, a calendar appointment, Trello card with reminder, whatever will work for you. If you're feeling confident that this person and task combo is now going to run smooth, ask for them to check back with you. Either way, make sure you build that agreement with a follow-up. You don't want to force an agreement because as you've learned in physics, F equals MA, force equals make angry. Now we're gonna continue on to act two. Let's rewind our story and this time observe the outcome as these crucial accountability strategies are employed. Ready, Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Shop, do you have a moment? Sure. I noticed this afternoon that it appears that you didn't update the Trello card for assembling the Bazinga arm. I just came from 116 and they're trying to find the gusset used to rivet the Bazinga arm to the robot. Oh, I know where that is. I put it on the assembly RSU last night. I'll get it now. Mr. Shop leaves to get the gusset and returns a few minutes later. Hey, I'm back. Here's the, uh, here's the part. Thank you for getting the gusset. I would still like to discuss the team's expectations for leaving sufficient breadcrumbs for a task at the end of the meeting 
and how it appears you didn't do that last night with respect to the Bazinga arm. Hmm. Okay, I guess. You know, a lot of people... You know, a lot of people don't update Trello. I agree with you that others don't consistently update Trello. I'm working with them as well. Right now, I would like us to focus on why updating Trello is so important. Okay. As the project manager, I review all the Trello cards before the meeting to create a high-level plan. If a card isn't updated, I don't know the status of the story a task, and I can't effectively plan the meeting. As a result, other tasks may end up getting delayed, blocked, and the team isn't as productive without this effective plan. Oh, I didn't realize you read all the cards before each meeting. That does make it more important. It's not just about me. Today you are busy revising essays for the Impact Award, which is really important. As a result, others are working on the Bazinga arm. Without the Trello card updated, they had to ask around until they found people who understood the current status. They didn't want to interrupt you since you're working on the Impact Award today. Yeah, last night I, I forgot I was going to be working on the Impact Award today and thought it would be and thought I would still be working on the Bazinga arm assembly. So I didn't think I'm trying updating Trello was uh, that important. I know what to do next. While that is understandable, plans often change. You may miss a meeting unexpectedly or be pulled into a higher priority task. Our schedule this year is really aggressive. We need to be efficient, which means everyone needs to be able to quickly figure out the status of any task. Yeah, that makes sense. Back to the gusset. While you were able to find it quickly, what if you weren't here today? Or what if another team member found the gusset on the assembly RSU and moved it onto a shelf in holography to make room to work on a task? Or what if another team member mistakes it for a gusset for a different mechanism and tries to use it to assemble that one? Or what if Mr. Jarrett makes a run to the scrap metal center and grabs the gusset for recycling since it's not in a tote? I can see the importance of the updating Trello. Since you are the one who has to clean up at the end of meetings and make sure there are enough breadcrumbs for the next day, I'm interested in what you think you should do. Hmm. I guess it's not that hard. I should just update Trello and put all the parts in the tote. It sounds easy, but we know that it's not. We identified a couple of influence that made it challenging to do so. That's true. In terms of updating Trello, I'm too busy with homework when I get home after robotics. I don't think I can reliably do it after the meeting. It's good to be honest with yourself. What's another option? Hmm. I suppose I could set an alarm at 8.40 every night. That would give me and everyone else plenty of time to update Trello and put everything away where it belongs. I like your plan, but I'm not sure that 20 minutes will be enough time to get your task done. Maybe 8.30 would be a better choice for the first few days. If it works well, you can share your plan with the whole team, and you can all hold each other accountable when the alarm goes off. That's a good idea. Okay. Is there anything else that you know of that could cause this to not work for you? Not that I could think of. Great. Can I meet up with you by 5 p.m. at the next meeting to see how tonight's breadcrumbs worked? Sure. Okay. Let me summarize to make sure we're both on the same page. You're going to set a repeating alarm now for 8.30 for each meeting, starting with today's meeting. The alarm will remind you to start the mental and physical cleanup, which includes both updating Trello with enough breadcrumbs that another team member can pick up the work if you aren't here, and getting parts labeled and put in totes. I will find you by 5 p.m. at the next meeting to see how the breadcrumbs worked. Did I get that right? Yes, that's the plan. A week later. Mr. Shop, is everything okay? We have not seen you for the past week. Yeah, I was sick for a few days, and then I had a band concert. I hope you're feeling better now. Thanks. I'm starting to feel better. I wanted to thank you for updating the Trello card. While you were gone for a week, we were able to finish the Bazinga arm because you did a great job of documenting it. We are on track to deliver the finished product today. You're welcome. By the way... I had an idea how to make our sprint planning meetings more efficient. Wonderful. 
What's your idea? And that's the end of Act Two. Now we're going to move into another breakout. The accountability plan is very straightforward, and the example you just heard was relatively easy. But this normally does not happen. It doesn't happen on student teams, and it doesn't happen in corporate America. So we'd like you to take the time in your breakout rooms and discuss the following two questions. What is going to be personally difficult or awkward about developing and communicating an accountability plan? What can you do to overcome your personal difficulties and awkwardness? We're gonna give you a couple minutes to discuss this and we'd like someone in your team that hasn't read out to read out when they come back. And All right. you have the rooms ready, sir. I do. Here we go. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Can we get um, maybe two volunteers to read out on what they came up with for their breakout? Uh, Ayush. Yeah, we, um, one thing that we said was like, uh, was going to be personally difficult was like remembering to follow up. I mean, like one thing that we said to overcome this was like having the idea that like robotics isn't just um, on Wednesday from like, or whatever day from I guess 2.30 to 9, like there's, you can also check up like the next day and uh, kind of create a plan of action um, after checking up with the person um, to kind of execute the next meeting. I think that would be a good idea. Um... So in, in the example they had using, um, you know, your phone alarm or a calendar reminder, I think those would also be good ideas for someone who's performing the follow-up, right? You could set an, a, your own reminder to do follow-ups. So who's, who would else would like to um, read out? Mr. Fry. Uh, we said like documenting everything is like might be hard and one of the ways around that is like to set a reminder for yourself like wherever you um, keep your homework you can write down like document everything for robotics or like you said set an alarm sure maybe even make a trail card for yourself mm -hmm. of, of the action and follow-up Good ideas, really good ideas, guys. Moving along. <clears throat> in the larger culture we have grown up in, there's a strong emphasis on celebrating big accomplishments. The person who is in the right place at the right time to save the day gets many accolades and that are often over the top. But what about the people who day in and day out show up to get the job done? people who routinely reduce the risk of failure by following the work processes. The people who communicate early when they see an impending problem, when they see the save the day person reaping the rewards of being lucky, this might cause their motivation to falter. This is a social motivation issue. If the people around them only celebrate big accomplishments, and they're going to look for ways to have big accomplishments. And they are going to get bummed out. If your organization only celebrates these lucky people, then it's a structural motivation as well. <clears throat> so when you read this line at the top about praising more than you think you should, we don't mean throwing huge parties. We do mean finding ways to praise people for doing their job well ways that will motivate them to keep doing good work. Some of the people who do this praise job well regularly set aside time to look for things that they can praise. They also make sure to create appropriate social influences by celebrating individuals in private. Congratulations, we have made it to the summary of crucial accountability part. Here are um, here in 
one flow, you can see all the steps. I'm going to take a second for you to just take a look at the slide and see how all of these things are interlinked to each other. And for those who like, uh, for those that don't like flowcharts, here is a play on words. To move from accountability in action to accountability in action, you just need to insert a space. Seek their true issues. Provide room for them to see the problems develop and solutions. Accept their solutions even if not perfect. Celebrate their work and earn their trust. And it's over to you, Mr. Schmidt. All right. Here is a somewhat troubling fact. Fewer than one in eight workplace change efforts produce anything other than cynicism. So whether it's in a corporate environment, a school, a robotics team, fewer than one in eight have any positive impact. For this section of tonight's leadership workshop, we're going to focus on influence. So we're going to shift our lens from that of accountability to that of influence. We're going to focus on how to change the world, no small task. We're going to look at the six sources of influence through a different lens, and then explore the critical questions to ask ourselves to influence change. The six sources of influence shape our choices and over time shape our behaviors. These behaviors produce results, both good and bad. This is just how the world works. Great leaders use this model from right to left. First, focus on results. Great leaders are better at articulating what they want to achieve and how they will measure it. Second, identify a small handful of vital behaviors. These are the specific behavioral changes needed to disproportionately improve results. Third, engage all six sources of influence to support your vital behaviors. This is how we can change the world. The different perspective that we are taking in this portion of the workshop is being proactive rather than reactive. We still need to employ crucial accountability skills reactively. This will always occur. If we employ crucial influence skills, we can reduce the number of reactive conversations. The six sources of influence here have not changed. With the accountability lens, we use the six sources of influence reactively to identify and then remove obstacles to achieve the desired result. However, now through the influence lens, we will be using the six sources of influence proactively to support the essential behaviors that will lead to the desired results. Let's look at the first one, focused on personal motivation through the lens of influence. All four of these are reframing tactics. One. A change of heart can't be imposed. It can only be chosen. People are capable of making enormous sacrifices when they have the choice to act on their own. An influential leader's job is to help them find their own reason to choose the vital behavior. Two, create direct experiences. The most powerful way to help people recognize, feel, and believe in the long-term implications of their choices is to get out of their way and let them experience them firsthand. Ask people to just try it. People tend to resist new behaviors because they're crystal clear about what they'll lose by changing, but uncertain about what they'll gain. When it comes to change, humans tend to overvalue what they're losing while undervaluing what they gain. 
and no amount of cheerleading will allay the fears as fast as a hands-on experience. Third, another way of creating a vicarious experience is through storytelling. This powerful influence tool is available to all leaders and requires zero resources and very little time. When influential leaders recognize that others aren't personally motivated to enact a vital behavior, they don't work around the problem. They work through it. They operate on the confidence that people are not morally defective, but morally asleep. When called for, they create vicarious experiences through telling compelling stories. Finally, consider making it a game and consider the elements of what makes a game enjoyable. Keeping score, competition, constant improvement, and control. When we shift and look at the second source of influence, personal ability, there are three elements of deliberate practice that should be part of any effort. Practice one or two specific skills at the edge of ability with immediate feedback and coaching. The connection to edge is that these three steps focus on the guide part. Our natural tendency is to attribute most negative behavior to motivational problems and almost never consider whether ability is playing a role. If you want to influence change, it's best to do the opposite. Consider ability problems first, motivation second. Our third source of influence is social motivation. Smart leaders appreciate the tremendous power humans hold over one another. And instead of denying it, lamenting it, or attacking it, they embrace and enlist it. They use the power of social influence to support change by ensuring that the right people provide encouragement, coaching, and even accountability during crucial moments. Great leaders ensure that people feel praised, emotionally supported, and encouraged by those around them every time they enact vital behaviors. And they ensure that people feel discouraged when they make the wrong choice. Once you foster these new norms, change becomes almost inevitable. Raising the question, how do you create new norms? Here's how. Make the undiscussable discussable. This connects back to having a team player mindset. And secondly, create 200% accountability. Create an environment in which everyone is responsible not just to enact the vital behaviors themselves, but to hold others accountable for them as well. Our fourth source is social ability. And effective leaders build plans that provide social permission. Those with formal or informal authority must overtly enable behavior that might have been taboo in the past. Modeling. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a live model who shows what the vital behavior looks like is worth millions. Help. Help is needed when people haven't yet mastered the new behavior. And finally, real-time coaching is needed to lift others to the next level. Learning is accelerated when coaching immediately follows an initial attempt at a new behavior. When we look at the fifth source of influence, structural motivation, we have four potential ideas. Use extrinsic rewards after personal and social motivators. Get so personal and social motivators in place first let the value of the behavior itself, along with social influences, carry the bulk of the motivational load. Use incentives wisely. Don't be afraid to draw on small, heartfelt tokens of appreciation. Remember, when it comes to extrinsic rewards, less is often more. Reward behavior, not just results. Take care to link rewards to the vital behaviors you want to see repeated, not just the results. Sometimes outcomes hide inappropriate behaviors. And finally, discipline sparingly. If you end up having to administer discipline, first take a shot across the bow. Let people know what's coming before you impose some type of a punishment. Then if all else fails, follow through on the consequences. The care with which we need to enact extrinsic rewards reminds me of this Dilbert cartoon um, about software development and rewarding software engineers.
I don't think the boss um, is familiar with crucial influence here. All right, last and certainly not least is structural ability. One of the simplest ways to increase your influence is to make physical and virtual changes that make bad behavior harder and good behavior easier. Five ways to do this. Add a cue. Use cues to prompt attention at the moment a new behavior is needed. Change the data stream. Influence hearts and minds by exposing people to information that helps them see what happens when vital behaviors are and are not practiced. Promote physical proximity. Use distance to shape choices. Research shows that the frequency and quality of human interaction is largely a function of physical distance. When leaders fail to foster social proximity, bad things happen. Silos form, inviting reigns. This is one reason that we eat dinner as a whole team every day. Make it easy. Do all you can to make behavior reasonably easy and obvious. And finally, change your process. Where possible, build the new behavior into policies and process, processes. To look again through the lens of influence, let's rewind this scene. How and where can we in, insert influence to achieve the results we like? So I'm going to ask the captains to join us as well. See if they are unmuted. The scene is a preseason meeting with the captains and coaches. I will spotlight some of you here. We need to improve our productivity this year in order to be more competitive. What are some vital behaviors that are needed in order to achieve that goal? One is that we need to be more consistent at updating our Trello cards with detailed information about what we did, what needs to be done. Also, um... Where are we at? You're about to wonder. Uh, sorry. <laughs> How can, how can we apply the six sources of influence to ensure we make this change? We should share the story of how last year when we lost the gusset, we had to fabricate it again. This delayed the completion of that feature and delayed other features. We can incorporate Trello into our member skills training during the preseason and have everyone actually create and manipulate Trello cards. We need to set the expectation with the leads that they need to reinforce this behavior with their team members. The FPMs are going to be critical in terms of modeling this behavior. If the team sees the FPMs doing this, they will do it too. We could reward the sub-team that has the greatest percentage of cards updated clearly after each meeting with first access to seconds at dinner. We can also schedule our meetings so that work stops at 8.30 and emphasize that we have 30 minutes for both mental and physical cleanup, which includes updating Trello. Several months later, during the build season at dinner, Mr. Shop, do you have a moment? Sure. Thanks for updating Trello for the Bazinga Arm Assembly. While you were busy with the Impact Award this afternoon, others were able to make some progress. That's good to hear. I had forgotten until the meeting that I'd be working on the Impact Award today. All good. You left plenty of breadcrumbs for others to make progress. Thanks for that. You're welcome. I'm off to get seconds. And a week later, Hmm. Wow, it's 8.30. Already, time to update Trello and get cleaned up. Hey, Jack, remember to update Trello. Mr. Shop, you look really busy. What are you doing over there? Leaving breadcrumbs. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right, we already apply some sources of influence to help us reach our goals. It's not like we aren't doing this. Um, so we're gonna do one final breakout. Um, 
linked in your handouts is a link to the 2023 season goals from last year to choose one of our goals, not one of our objectives, but one of our goals, like you'll see on the page, they're categorized. Um, choose one within your group, identify an example of one source of influence that we did apply and identify an example of one source of influence that we didn't, but could apply. Okay. And then when we come back together, we'll share out uh, and see what you came up with. So I have the breakout rooms ready to go and we're off. All right, welcome back everyone. Let's hear from uh, at least a couple of groups here uh, in terms of which, please share which goal you focused on and then an example of a source of influence that we applied last year and a source of influence that we could have applied last year. All right, you can go ahead and raise your hand in the Zoom. Christine, go ahead. Okay, so at first we didn't realize what those influences were referring to, but we realized that uh, the goal um, hosting a team bonding event during a meeting such as the scavenger hunt we only did that once last year we would like to do more um, and the make sure no one is sitting alone at team dinner who hasn't specifically chosen to so we realized those could be from personal motivation so believing that you know if we're behind on other tasks or if we're, we have such a limited time it's not very important to do these things and so we could improve and influence on um, really emphasizing how important team values are. I hope I got that right. Yeah, absolutely. Jake? Um, so we looked at, within the objective of, like, becoming a world-class robotics team, um, we looked at, like, qualifying for 2023 Worlds, and kind of that had, like, a social, a bit of, like, a social motivation where, like, we becoming like a world-class robotics team and within that then qualifying for worlds if we can do that then it like makes it so we're known then by like other teams and stuff like that like we gain respect from other teams um and so it has that like social motivation where we want to uh gain um like that social awareness from other teams um and then one thing that we could kind of also add um and like I think for some people it's definitely there, but like add more of that like personal motivation. That's like, it's if it's a big team thing, but for like if we can make it more personal for people, then that makes it so that way the team is even more motivated. Great. Uh, let's do one more, Alex. What did uh, your group discuss? Uh, we discussed how uh, one of our goals was have every member certified in one sub team. So this year we're working on that by having that uh, spreadsheet for some some sub teams to show which uh, which members are trained in uh, certain skills that require um, that require a lot of safety. Um, and something that we haven't done yet is creating those training videos uh, for those sub teams so people so like the lead doesn't have to explain every single time and members can just go on the Google Drive and find a training video. Perfect, love it. Excellent. All right, thanks everyone. So what questions should we ask ourselves if we want to influence change? If we're not up against a great deal of resistance, we may not need to overthink the problem. It could be that simply throwing one or two more sources of influence at the behavior will invite change. That said, the primary value for these strat strategies is not just for solving big, hairy, overwhelming problems. If change is important, your goal should be to over-determine success. Unfortunately, that's not the way things work in most organizations. Because most organizations are used to striving for efficiency, most leaders ask, what's the least we can do to get results? 
leaders are less likely to fall prey to this mindset if they thoroughly diagnose the problem. If they've gathered data about how well or poorly all sources of influence are aligned with the behaviors they hope to foster, they create more realistic influence plans. Once again, like a couple weeks ago, there are so many more things to learn from these two books and from hopefully the corporate training that you may one day find yourself taking. Please, in the upcoming weeks, take the opportunity to ask your mentors and teammates for advice and direction on these topics. Take a look at the Trello cards with notes on how to hold a conversation or how to hold someone accountable with compassion. Next up in our workshop series, we have Project Management in Famica Plus, which is being prepared by Jubin and Mr. John. And the following week, we have Vision and Goals. Either in the last couple of minutes here um, before we go or tomorrow, uh, please take just a moment to capture any feedback on this leadership workshop session in terms of what we should keep doing, what we should consider fixing, or what we should consider trying next time. And the link to the Keep Fix Try is in the handouts as well. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, and especially thank you to Mr. Chop for leading us through um, this session this week as well.